Okay, now we are ready to prove the Schroeder's fixed point theorem. So this is the uh, extension of the Brouwer's fixed point theorem uh, to the in infinite dimensional space. Okay, so let's start with uh, a uh, Banach space X or B space. Let's try to be more general. B space and uh, C is a closed convex set. And T is a mapping from C to C itself, which is continuous. Let's suppose the image of uh, of C under this mapping T is sequentially compact. Then we can claim that T is a T has a fixed point in C. Okay, so this theorem is present here. Uh, the theorem is present in a very general form. Uh, usually when you see the Schroeder's fixed point theorem, it could be written in a more special uh, form with uh, stronger conditions. In those cases, uh, the proof will be even easier. So this will be uh, a general version. So for example, uh, if you see that the uh, you have a, a B space rather than, or Banach space rather than B star, uh, B star space, and say if C is compact, then you just need to know that T is continuous because uh, if C is compact, then, then T of C must be compact as well. And uh, we know that in this already implies that, or this two already implies that T of C is compact. And we know in uh, metric space, compact is equivalent to sequentially compact. So automatically you have all the conditions. And then you can directly claim that T has a fixed point. Okay, so this is the uh, you know a simpler version of this Schroeder's fixed point theorem, but we're going to prove the the general version here. Okay, so um, so what do we know about this um, uh, this uh, image of C is that it's sequentially compact. And this sequentially compact means that it's totally bounded, as we uh, proved before. So since T of C is sequentially compact, we know T of C is totally bounded. Okay, it's totally bounded means that for any k, integer k, there exists a finite. 1 over k net. Okay. Which we call the nk. So nk is just the y1, y2 to y and k. Just have finite many elements or uh, vectors such that the uh, t of c is covered by this uh, of k net. So just to take the union of the balls with centers at those uh, at those y's with the radius 1 over k. i is from 1 to n k. Okay. And uh, we can define, so we let e to be the span of these y's. So actually, we, sorry, we really don't need this at all. We will just use the, let's just uh, denote the ck to be the convex hull of these points. Okay, you re remember what is convex hull? It's just that uh, say you have a bunch of points, just uh, making a uh,
just make up this uh, polyhedron, which is just a convex combination, all possible convex combinations of these points. Uh, then you have the convex hull. And apparently, because you have only finite many points, um, this hull must be, the convex hull must be bounded. Right? It must be bounded, and uh, it is convex as well. So this is convex. Bounded and actually also closed because you only have finite many points. Okay, just because that this is the, by definition the uh, convex combinations of those points is uh, lambda i y. Where the lambda i's are greater than or equal to zero, and the sum of those lambda i's equals is equal to one. So it's a closed, convex, and bounded. Okay. Now let's consider um, a mapping card i as a mapping from the T of C, the image of C to this CK. Okay, so both are in the C. So let's say we have this is our C. And uh, this whole thing is mapped into T of C under the T. Okay, and the, um, so this IK is a TC to C itself, so it's already uh, in the right hand side, always in this, in this one here. And the, the definition of this CK, of this I, is that for any Y, it's going to be mapped to this IK of Y, where this y, IK of Y is defined as a convex combination of those Ys. So it's going to be MI, Y, this is like the lambda I, and then we have the YI, and the I is from 1 to NK. And the, the key right now is how do we define these MIs? Okay, so as I said, it's MI of Y, there will be the convex hull. Um, let me I actually use lambda. Maybe it's better here. Lambda I. So depending on where this Y is, I'm going to define this lambda I. This will be my convex combination. And uh, this lambda I is defined as follows. I first define the mi of y, and uh, according to, so the i indicates one of these points, one of these uh, y's, and uh, if y is inside b of yi over k, then I'm going to take the value 1 minus k times y minus yi. Otherwise, I'm going to take zero. So I'm going to I'm going to explain why what this means. Okay, so I know that for every y in this uh, in the set, um, since this is covered by this, so I know that any y here will be covered by at least one of these balls. Okay, so covered by one of these balls, for example, it is covered by this ball. Uh, the ball centered at the yi with radius 1 over k, that means the distance between y and the yi is less than 1 over k. Okay, and I'm just looking at, uh, say I can start to look for, look at the y here. I know that the, uh, if I draw a ball with the radius 1 over k, then I know that uh, since this y, is in here and it's covered by this union and I know that at least the y is covered by one of them. That means at least one of these y's is inside this ball right here. Okay, so it depends on uh, where this point is and then it depends on how many of those y's are falling into this. I'm going to take the, say for example, I have the y i and maybe another y j and then maybe another y k, not, not k, maybe y l. They're in here, 
So I'm looking at the distance between those. So this is telling me the distance. Okay, and I know that distance must be smaller than one over k. So that means this value is always bigger than zero. But the point right now is that depending on how close this this is, if this is really close, for example, the y i is really close to y, then this value will be very small, and then that means this value is relatively large. But the the point right now is that I'm looking at all the y i's from the one over k net. I look at those points and see which one falls into this ball, and then uh, using their distance to to give me this m i value. And if there is a yi outside, and I don't, I don't care. So their weights will be given as zero. And once I have those values, I can form this lambda i by normalizing this mi's. So the lambda i of y will be just mi of y divided by the sum of mi of y. And as you can see, I know that at least one of this is zero. And uh, the sum of this, uh, take the sum of this, oh, sorry, at least one of this is non zero, it's positive. And then the sum of this is also positive. So when I normalize it, then you can see the lambda i will be non negative, and the sum of lambda i will be equal to one. Right? The sum of lambda i will be equal to one. Okay, and so if it is the this lambda is equal to zero or greater than zero, it totally depends on if the corresponding y is falling into this ball. Okay, if falling into this ball, then it will be a positive number. Uh, otherwise, it will be out. Otherwise, lambda will be zero. Okay, so this is the convex combination, and then you can see that my mapping i k is defined in this way. Is I'm mapping from um, the uh, this set to a convex combination of the y, so that means it's in the convex hall, right? So that's how I define this i k. Okay, with this i k, I can see a, a simple property of this y k. It tells me that uh, the y k doesn't shift or doesn't change the location of y much. And the reason is why take the Difference between what the, the y and the and the, the i k of y. You see the difference between them. Uh, according to my definition for the i k, it should be the sum of the lambda i y times the y i. i is from 1 to k. Okay. okay, and on the other hand, I know that my y can be written as. I just multiply y by 1, it doesn't change, but uh, I know that's lambda i of y, is so they will sum to 1. Okay, so this is like I'm multiplying, y, uh, multiplying 1 to y. Okay, and now I can see that they all have the same coefficients, so I can combine them. I have a lambda i, y, times the y i minus y, as from 1 to nk. And then by triangle inequality, I know this is just less than, continue writing there. This is less than or equal to the sum of the lambda i for y times the y i minus y. i is from 1 to nk. Okay, so remember that the y, lambda i of y could be either 0 or could be some value like this. Okay, let me just uh, split them. For those that lambda i is greater than zero, I put them together. I have this y i minus y, and then I also have those. Sorry, this is greater than zero, and I also have those that the corresponding lambda i is equal to zero. Okay, so now the point is. Uh, this is a sum where this is zero. So it's zero, then every term of this is zero. It just goes to zero. So this term is totally gone. And then we look at this. I know that this is less than one. 
right? And even the sum of them must be less than one. And this, this is the distance between y and the yi's. And now that the yi's are inside this ball, so each of this is less than one over k. And the sum of this is less than one, or less than equal to one. So the whole, everything together, it will be still less than, um, less than one over k. As I said, this is a smaller than one over k. This is a smaller or equal to one. So the whole thing is less than one over k, and this is just zero. Right? That's how I get this. It's less than one over k, and it's less than one over k means that, you know, these two are really really close. Okay, so this is the uh, proof of that. Actually, we can see this from the picture. You know, because I'm taking the i of i k of y is just in the convex hull of the uh, the y's falling into this. So you can see if I say the y i's are these three points that are inside, then the i k of y will be just inside the convex hull, which means that it's inside this triangle. But I know that this ball is convex. And the convex hull must be inside this ball. So that means the point ik of y must be inside this ball as well. Okay? It's inside this ball means that the distance between ik of y and y must be less than 1 over k. Okay, so this is another way to show that. Uh, but either way, we can get this result. Okay, now finally, we're going to show uh, how we get the uh, limit, uh, how to get the fixed point. Okay, let's define. We can define the TK as the composition of IK and T. So originally, we know that T is takes the is a mapping from C to T of C, right? And then the IK is from T. C to CK. CK is a convex hull of the uh, one over K net. Okay, so that's my TK then. So the TK is a mapping from C to CK. But remember that, uh, as we said before, the CK is a convex set. The CK is a convex set. So these points are all in C. Right, these are points are in C, and so uh, this convex hull of them will be also in C because C is convex, and the CK will be the smallest convex set containing this, these points. So that's why the CK is included in C. Okay, this is because this is a convex hull of Y one or Y I, and this each Y is contained in C, and the C is con also convex. That's why the CK is inclu included in C. So that's why when we restrict ourselves, so this when we restrict the TK onto the set CK, it will be also a mapping to from CK to CK. Okay, it's like I'm I know that I'm mapping from C to ck and now i'm just looking at a subset which is ck and it will be also mapped to the ck there right so now i have a mapping t and that is mapping from ck to ck and remember that the ck here is closed convex bounded okay and this t itself um The TK here uh, is um, it's like it's a mapping from such a set CK to CK itself. So we know that there is a uh, fixed point of this TK. Which means that there exists uh, XK in CK such that the tk xk is equal to c xk. And uh, um, I should also say that the tk 
uh, for this fixed point to exist, we also need to show that PTK is con continuous. Uh, but TK is composition of these two. And T, we know, is continuous. So we just need to show that IK is continuous. Actually, by the definition of IK, it will be easy to show that it's continuous because um, this totally depends on what is lambda I of Y is. And uh, lambda I of Y is totally depend on the lambda I. But the lambda I is continuous function for Y. Given the points y1 through y k, so we can uh, we can actually easily show that this i k is a continuous mapping. So the composition of the two continuous mapping is still continuous, and now it's a continuous mapping from a closed convex bounded set to another closed convex bounded set to itself, I should say. So that's why the there exists a fixed point. So the x k is a fixed point, and that means the t k x k is equal to x k. Okay, now uh, for each k we can do this. For each integer k we can do this. Or each natural number k we can do this. So I get a sequence. I get a sequence. Notice that this uh, x k um, are from the c k, right? So there, x k is from c k. So the tk t of xk will be so let's consider the, the sequence. Consider this particular sequence is just generated. We know that txk will be a sequence in tc. Now this is where we're going to use the sequential compactness of the t of c. Now we have a sequence right here. And there's a sequence in that, that means this one has a convergent subsequence, right? So I know that. So sequentially compact. You know that Txk has a convergent subsequence. Which we denote by x k j say. Okay, now on the one hand, I know that uh, this is a convergent subsequence, and they are living in the T of C, and the you know T of C is a subset of C. So and C is closed. So I have a convergent subsequence means that it has a accumulation point, and since it is uh, this is essentially a sequence in C. So the accumulation point must be in C as well, since C is closed. So that means I know there exists some point, I call it X, it's in C, such that the T X K J convert to X as J goes to infinity. Okay, so this is what I have. Uh, on the one hand, I know that I have a Subsequence of the sequence I just generated, and uh, the t of this sequence after the se subsequence after the mapping t will converge to a point in C. So this is the one thing that we know. Another thing we know is that also know that uh, we have. I took a like like look at the distance between x k and x. Actually, we don't know if these two are close uh, or not. So uh, what do we only know is that this this is going to be closer and closer to x. But this is equal to x k j. Uh, sorry, it's, so I shouldn't say that. This, I just know that this goes to x. So let's see if we can get something out of it. Uh, the i k minus so the x k minus x. I know that x k is the fixed point. It's a fixed point of t k. So I can rewrite it as t k x k minus x. And now I'm going to get the tkxk minus txk. This is how, how I get closer to this thing. Okay, and then I have a add the xk minus x. And then I can apply the triangle inequality I will have is tkxk minus txk plus txk minus x. And now uh, I'm going to rewrite this tk. I know that tk is ik txk. 
and then I also have the TXK plus the TXK minus X. Remember that the TXK here is in the TC. So it's like the Y above. For each Y, uh, I can take the mapping to this, and I know that the distance between Y and the mapping after the IK has distance less than 1 of K. Right, so this run right now is like my TXK. This is like my TXK. So what I have here is just the IK of TXK minus TXK. I know this thing will be less than 1 over K. And the other one, I really don't know how small it is. Just keep it there. Okay, so I don't really have anything to do, uh, anything else to do with this, because I don't really know how to estimate this. But I do know that this is going to x. For if I look at the subsequence of that, I know that they convert to x. So now I'm just focusing on subsequence. Because this is true for every k, I know this is also true for the subsequence. Okay, now we get we're getting something because the the k is tending to infinity, right? k is increasing. So the kj is also going to infinity. So that means this one is approaching to zero. And also this one approaches to zero as j goes to infinity since we have that. Okay, so I know that this goes to zero as j goes to infinity. Okay, and what this tells us is that the xkj itself also goes to x. But from here, we know that the t of x, k, j will go to t of x, since t is continuous. So on the one hand, I know that t, x, k, j goes to t, x. On the other hand, I know that t, x, k, j goes to x itself. So I'm having the same sequence, but they are converging, they are convergent, and they're converging to this. That means these two limits, you know, they can only convert to one limit. So that means these two values are the same. So that's why the tx equals to x. And this shows that the existence of the fixed point of t inside the ck. OK, so that's how we proved this theorem. Shoulders fixed point theorem. OK, but now let's look at an exam uh, example or application of this. So previously, remember that we used the Banach fixed point theorem to prove the uh, existence of a solution, and even the uniqueness of the solution of uh, 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 of ODE, right? And here I'm going to also show the existence of uh, the solution of ODE. But notice that here we don't have uniqueness in general. Um, this is different from the Banach fixed point theorem, where we do have uh, uniqueness. Since remember that pro the uh, the shrinkage or shrinking parameter theta is strictly less than one, that's how we get get a fixed point, a unique fixed point. But here we don't really have, uh, in general we don't have a fixed uh, we don't have a unique fixed point, and that's also uh, an issue inherent to this uh, result. We prove the existence of the solution of the ODE below. We cannot guarantee uniqueness. So the setup is similar to before. We're going to first set up a uh, ODE. So we need this f of tx. So okay, there's a continuous function on the uh, set u. This u is just uh, a square. t minus h, t plus h. This is for the interval uh, of t. And then also have c minus b, c plus b, this is for interval for x. Okay. Where m needs to be the maximum 
of f of tx, where tx is in u, and the uh, h is less than b over m. Okay, so basically, what this says is that in this u, uh, the f cannot be too large; it should be bounded by it should be bounded by, by this m. And according to how large this m is, this h uh, should be bounded by b over m. So if this m is really large, what that means is remember that for ODE, this means x dot or x prime is f of tx. If f of tx on the right side is too large, that means this x is changing too quickly. Uh, and in this case, it's harder to guarantee the existence of the solution. And in this case, uh, we should uh, we can only guarantee existence of solution uh, in a in a shorter interval when t is not too large and that is uh, reflected by this h h cannot be too large okay so that's uh, <clears throat> intuitively what this what this h uh, stands for then the ODE let's look at the ODE here which is given by the x prime t f of t x t where this t is from negative h to h, and x0, x0 is, uh, is c. Okay, and uh, we guarantee that this ODE has a, a solution. Okay. So, uh, condition is pretty easy. We have this ODE, and as long as the right hand side is bounded by m, and this h is not too large, which h is bounded by b over m, and this b tells me how large this value can change eventually, and, uh, then we're guaranteed that we're guaranteed that this OD has a solution, and we're going to prove this using the Schroeder's fixed point theorem. You can see how powerful that is. Well, uh, to prove this, we first we recall that. Uh, we first need to establish, or we first need to uh, construct this convex and uh, closed uh, set, right? Convex and closed uh, subset of the C K. Uh, sorry, of the inter of the uh, space of functions C. So this is the space of functions that we're looking for. We're looking for a solution inside. Right, and also uh, let's look at a closed ball inside it, which is this. Okay, so this right here stands for all the functions x, so mapping from negative h to h to real number, and that the x t. I should say dx minus kc is less than equal to b. So right now you can treat this kc as a constant function on the interval negative h to h. And x is a function on negative h to h as well. And this tells me that this is the maximum of xt minus kc. Since kc t is a constant function, so it doesn't matter uh, <coughs> what uh, where it is t where this t is for, for c, it's negative h to h. Okay, this is what this norm means. So now I'm, this is the set I'm going to consider. Okay, and it's easy to show that it's closed and convex. Okay, so now I have this first. Um, then I'm going to define a continuous mapping from this ball to itself.
defined by have a mapping T and it takes any point in this ball, which is a function, and I got a new function. Now how this new function is defined? Now as you can imagine, I'm going to define to be C plus 0 to T f of s x s ds. Okay, and the reason of this is because if tx is equal to x itself, then I will have xt equals to c plus 0 to t f of s x s ds. And this is the integral form for this ODE. So this and this are equivalent. Right? So now I, this is a, this is why I define this t in this way, and I'm going to show that this t has a fixed point. And before that, we need to show uh, two things. We first need to show that this t is indeed a mapping from here to here. That means for any point in here, it will be the t, for any point x in here, the t of x must be in here. That's one thing. The other thing is that the t must be continuous. Okay, so to show that this is indeed a mapping of the closed ball, it is to itself, we can see that, let's look at the distance between this, this Tx, and the C. And according to the definition, it should be just uh, the, uh, um, you know, this is just um, the maximum, of so the at is less than u to h and we have the tx which is the one above so it's that f of s x s ds minus c so this because they actually cancel with this so i only have the one in the middle and this one is less than or equal to the maximum again I just copy this one here 0 to t, f, f, s, x, s, d, s. Okay. Remember that uh, my axis from here, my axis from this ball. Okay. So that means my, uh, my x, t, minus C is always less than or equal to B. Okay? If that's the case, remember that uh, this point xt and the t, I should say, um, yeah, if look at this, for any t with the absolute value less than h, I know that this point is in this u here because the t is absolutely in this and the x of t I know that is in here so that means it's in u and so in u means that the f of this must be less than or equal to m right as I showed here so that means this one is actually less than or equal to m okay so it's less than or equal to m and the t can be as large as h so it's m less than or equal to m times h But remember that h is chosen small enough so that hm is less than or equal to b. And why, that's why this is less than or equal to b. And this means that t of x is also inside the ball centered at c with the radius b. And it's less than or equal to, so I have to have the closed ball. Okay, so this shows that t is indeed a mapping of the closed ball to itself. Now let's check if t is continuous. Okay, to show that t is continuous, let's look at the show t as a mapping from b to itself is continuous. Okay, to show that, we just need to recall the definition. The t of x minus t of y 
according to the definition, this is just a, you know, the maximum of this for, remember this is defined as a function of t and then that's c plus zero to t f of x, sorry, s, x s, d s. And similarly for the ty, it just replace this by y s. So that's why the like xc uh, is containing in both, so they are canceled. And then we we'll have the 0 to t f of x, sorry, the end is sx, minus 0 to t f of s, y s, ds. Okay? And this should be less than or equal to the maximum of that. Right? And now the question is, if this right-hand side is small enough? Well, we know that f is continuous. Okay. Since f is continuous, we know that for any epsilon, there exists a delta. Such that the f of x or f of t eta minus f of t prime eta prime can be less than I'm going to set this to epsilon over h for any t eta t prime eta prime as long as these two points are close enough close enough by eta by delta I know this will be true. Okay, this is by continuity of f. And similarly here, uh, if the x and the y are close, how close they are, they just need to be, I just need to make sure that x minus y is less than or equal to delta, or less than delta. If this is less than delta, that means for each point s, the distance between these two should be less than delta. Right, because it's started to be it's defined as the is bigger than the norm. That means um, as long as x and y satisfies this, so then these two are less than delta. If these two are less than delta, remember this s are the same. So that means I will have s here. Now I have the f of sorry x s here, and this is the y s here. And then you can see this is the s, this is x s, and this is the s and the y s. I know that this distance will be less than delta. The s is the same, right? So that absolutely that will be less than delta. And if this is less than delta, I know that this whole thing here is less than epsilon over h because uh, of how I set up this delta. Okay, so this means that less than equal to uh, delta, sorry, less than equal to epsilon over h, which is the, the magnitude of the integrand times the, the largest value of the interval, which is also h. So this is equal to h, epsilon. For all x and y inside the ball with the radius or with distance satisfying the distance less than delta or less than delta okay and this shows that as long as x and y are close enough the tx minus ty will be less than epsilon so that's why the t is continuous so now we prove that the t is actually a mapping from this to this and this uh, is a closed convex set and t is a continuous mapping from this set to itself Okay, and now if we want to apply the Schauder's uh, fixed point theorem, the only thing left is to show that the t 
of this set, meaning that the image of this set under T, in, which is inside now, inside this now, is sequentially compact. Okay? And then we can directly apply the Schroeder's uh, fixed point theorem. Okay, well, to show this set is sequentially compact, remember the Arzela Ascoli theorem. We just need to show that uh, it is uniformly bounded and uh, equicontinuous. Right? We just need to show that this set is uniformly bounded and uh, equicontinuous. Okay, then to show this, uh, we first show that it's uniformly bounded, and uh, it is. Uh, it can be seen from the. Uh, just look at directly look at this. According to the definition, this is just uh, the absolute value, or sorry, the norm of this C plus zero to T f of uh, x. Oh, I should say yeah. S, X, S, D, E, S, right? And this is a function of T, and I know that this is going to be less than equal to the value of C plus, let's just see that for, um, what is the maximum value of this uh, for all the T's between negative H to H? And apparently this is just a constant, so it would be triangle equally just giving me this. And then I need to look at like how large this could be uh, when t is ranging from negative h to h. And because this is less than, or absolute value of this is less than equal to m, and uh, this t is between negative h to h, so the whole thing will be just less than equal to this times, uh, this plus m times h. And this is a fixed value, right? This is a fixed value, it doesn't change for t, and that's why uh, every x in the ball is stand, is uh, bounded by that. That's why the uni it is uniformly uh, bounded. This set is uniformly bounded. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, look at this. If C, if they are uniformly, uh, they are equally continuous. So we know that Tx is also a function defined over negative h to h. Now let's look at Tx at two different a two different points. So according to the definition, it will be equal to, again, you can see here, this one has a like C plus zero to T F of S, X, S, D, S. And similar for the other one, T, X, T prime. Right, so that's why the C will be canceled. We have only T, zero to T, F of S, X, S, D, S minus 0 to t prime, f of s, x s, d s. And this is going to be less than or equal to, from t prime to t, f of s, x s, d s, right? And I know that this is less than or equal to m. So the whole thing will be less than or equal to, well, I'm assuming that t is greater than t prime, or the other way around, doesn't matter. Uh, you just switch these two, whichever is larger, you just on, put on the top. Then it will be less than equal to m times t minus t prime. Okay, and this shows that tx is actually Lipschitz continuous with m as a Lipschitz constant. And this I didn't specify what this x is. So now, for any x from this ball, after mapping t, it will become another function which is Lipschitz continuous. So if all everyone is Lipschitz continuous with the same m 
then you can claim that they are equally continuous. Okay? So the, uh, this is indeed uh, uniformly bounded, which is verified by the first one here. And uh, equicontinuous, which is uh, verified by the second one here, since everyone is M Lipschitz continuous. And now we have everything, right? We showed that the T is a mapping from a closed complex set to itself. T itself is continuous. And after the mapping, the image of this under T is sequentially compact. So uh, by the Schroeder's fixed point theorem, there exists a point x in this ball such that tx equals to x. And we explained before that what this means, because the tx is just a tx, and according to the definition, this is just an xt of t. It's just the same as this, and that's by definition this. And this is the integral form of the OD. Okay? Which is the solution of the OD. Okay, so this completes the proof. So you can see that we didn't really uh, consider any uh, constructive way to show the existence. Existence of solution. Instead, we just need to show that we have such a uh, mapping from a closed complex set to itself. And uh, the image of this is a sequential compact. You can directly claim that there is a unique solution. Okay, so this proves the existence of the solution. You don't have to you know, really look into what this f is. As long as f has satisfied this property, then it's guaranteed to have a solution. Okay, so this is the application. Okay, now this finished the uh, section about the convex set and the fixed points. We learned another fixed point, uh, fixed point theorem, which is useful, useful in uh, the infinite dimensional space. Uh, now we're going to talk about the Hilbert space. Okay. So Hilbert space is actually a special case of the Banach space. Uh, the reason we're going to introduce the Hilbert space is because in Banach space or B star space, we only have the norms which can help us to uh, to measure the distance between vectors. And when we have the distance, uh, we can use them to uh, develop the concept of convergence. We can see that if a sequence is going to be convergent, so we have the metric, but we have the metric defined. And, uh, uh, but in this case, we don't know, uh, unlike in real or in Euclidean space, where we have angles between vectors. And in Banach space or B star space, we don't have such a concept. We cannot tell what is angle between the vectors. So to reintroduce this concept into the infinite dimensional linear space, we can, uh, this is the, what, where the Hilbert space comes in. The Hilbert space is going to introduce the inner product into the space. And with the inner product, we can define the angles between vectors. And this will give us a lot of more structures of the, of the space, and they are going to give us many more properties. Okay. So before that, we just give a definition uh, called a sesquilinear fun functional. Okay, sesquilinear is just uh, a you know a general way or extension of the bilinear functional. Uh, so let's say so suppose we have a, a linear space, okay, and uh, let's say I have a sesquilinear functional a, 
A is a mapping from the product of x with itself to x. That means that it takes two points in x and it gives you one value, so it's not mapping to x. It's mapping to k. So uh, I'm just making it slightly more general here. The k could be either the set of real numbers or the complex numbers. Just making it slightly more general in just in this section. Okay. Um, and that's also why I'm saying that this A is going to be bilinear, because if it's just a R, then it's essentially just a bilinear functional. And this let's look at how this A is uh, defined and how it is how it's what the properties it needs to certify to be called a square linear functional. Okay, first, this is linear in the first argument. So you have alpha 1, x1 plus alpha 2, x2. Then it doesn't matter what this y is. Uh, so this is x and y. Doesn't matter what this y is, it's always equal to alpha 1 times a times a of x1 y plus alpha 2 a of x2 y. Second one is that it is um, um, how do I say this? If you have the linear combination in the second argument, which is this, then you also can split them. It's still kind of linear, but you have to put the conjugate on top. Okay, so if you're mapping to R only, then you know this conjugate would be just itself, and this is just basically bilinear, right? Essentially, just a bilinear functional. But if it's in mapping to C, then uh, you need to take you could look at the second argument. Uh, if you want to apply the linearity, when the alpha one alpha two get out, then you need to put the uh, uh, conjugate on, on them. Okay, and also. If you just uh, put the same x into a, then the qx is the a of x x is called the quadratic form. Okay, so that's just a square linear function. Okay, so there are a few, so you can basically see that this is going to help us um, to define the inner product. So I'm going to give uh, some simple uh, definitions, or simple properties of this square linear functional. So if I access linear space, Some square linear functional gray. Then the quadratic form is in R for all the A in X, if and only if the AX of Y is equal to the conjugate of a y x for any x and y. Okay, you can see why this is true. So this tells me that the, the quadratic form is a real number, it's a real valued, if and only if the a x y is the conjugate of a y x. 
Okay, let's see this direction. Okay, so apparently if this is true, I just put x equal to y. Now I'll have the a x x is equal to the conjugate of a x x, and this already tells me that a x x must be real valued, and this completes this direction. Okay, for the other direction, uh, suppose I know that a x x is real for every x, then let's just consider a of x plus y. In x plus y, I know this will be real because I'm, you know, this is just the same value putting it there. And so it's real means that I know this must be equal to the conjugate of itself since both sides are real. Okay, and now look at the left hand side. Left hand side equals to a x x plus a y x plus a y a x y plus a y y okay and the right hand side is a x x plus a x y plus a y x plus a y y and I'm going to put conjugate on every one of them uh, actually I need to only to need to put on this because the axx and the ayy, they are both real valued according to our uh, condition here. Okay, so these two sides of Mars must be equal, and then you can see it can cancel out and cancel out this, and also cancel out this. So that means the axx plus axy must be equal to axy conjugate plus ayx conjugate. Right? Okay, so now uh, for the same x and y, I will replace this y by i times y. i is the uh, unit imaginary number. This means this is equal to 1. So I put that. I put that inside. And what happens is I can have ax, a of x plus i, y a of again x plus y y will be equal to itself conjugate right i'll also have this so on the one hand i have this on the other hand i have this and then i can do the same procedure eventually i will be able to show that this implies that the i of a y x minus i of a x y is also equal to negative i a y x plus i a x y okay and then i can multiply i on both sides now i have negative a y x plus a x y equals to here I multiply i and I will get a y x minus a x y. Okay, and then I can just uh, adding add this to add this one here star then this one double star adding star and double star. I'll be able to get the a x y equals to a y x you can have the two but the, the two will be cancelled okay i'll have this and the, we didn't specify what the x and the y are which this is always true for any x and the y and that is on the right hand side okay so if the quadratic form is always real valued then uh, a x y is always equal to the conjugate of a y x so this is the property of the sesquicentimeter linear functional. Now we're going to define the inner product. Now 
to access a linear space and uh, I'm going to have this mapping this X to okay it's called a inner product If for any x and y, there is on the one hand, the inner product of x and y is equal to the conjugate of the inner product of y and x. Second is I know that in this case, the inner product of x and x itself must be uh, real, real valued as according to that. So this should be a statistical linear. This must be real valued and it's greater than or equal to zero. And it is equal to zero if and only if x is equal to zero. So basically means that this is positive definite. Okay, so if the cis linear functional uh, satisfies these two conditions, then we call this linear function, uh, this functional uh, inner product. Okay, and this is going to be matched uh, to be uh, aligned with what we interpret the inner product uh, in Euclidean space. Okay, and in this case, also called the x. And inner product space. Okay, now just like we define norm for a vector space or linear space, we define the inner part for uh, for a linear space, and we can actually can use this linear product to define norms, uh, which is this. So if you have x squared, it's just a, the norm of the inner product of x in itself. Okay, and the only thing that we just need to show that this is actually giving us a norm. According to the definition for the inner product, this is actually a norm. That's the only thing we need to show. And that's pretty easy to show as we will do later. Uh, but now I can see previously we have a norm a linear space or normal vector space which is given by that and that's the B star space and now we have this and the inner product and this is the inner product space and if both if the top one is complete then we call it the Banach space and if the bottom is bottom one is complete under the norm then we can call it we call it the Hilbert space okay, that's the relation between them Okay, so let's look at a few examples. Uh, apparently, the, the basic or most trivial example is in Rn, right? And uh, we have two vectors where x and y are both n-dimensional va vectors. Then the inner product is defined to be the xi, yi, i is from 1 to n. Right here, x is x1 through xn, y is y1 through yn. And also can consider the CN space where we have the inner product and that will be just the xi, yi bar or conjugate of y. Okay, and similarly this again we have the x and the y, but they are both in C and now. Okay, the components could be convex valued. Convex valued. Okay, so that's one example. Uh, we can also consider say L2 space and this is a space of uh, basically sequence of sequences right each point in L2 is a sequence where X is the inner part of X and Y is just to, to define as X1 
xi yi bar that is from 1 to infinity where this x is x1, x2 the yi is the y1, y2 all in c infinity I should say they are in c2, they are in l2 okay, they need to be integrable oh sorry, they need to be summable or square summable okay so that's an example. You can also consider examples like in R2 space and define inner product. In this case, for any U and V in this L2 space, the inner product of them is defined as U times V. Okay, or Ux. Well, if they are complex value, you can take the Ux and Vx bar dx it could be you no know, wherever the domain you are integrating okay and the u v r in l2 omega okay so these are examples we uh, probably uh, have in mind immediately and also this turns out to be uh, inner product space. So basically, usually when we write this, this means that it's the, well, it's continuous on to, up to the boundary. And also, you, you can take the derivative of all the interior points up to um, k to the power. Uh, because the derivative can only be taken as the interior point. So we assume the omega is open um, well, you only assume omega is open. You sometimes you assume it's bounded as well, uh, depending on the application. Uh, but it's open always. And then uh, inside the omega, every point is an interior point. You can talk about the derivative, even partial derivatives. And uh, but it still continues up to the boundary, so it continues extended to the boundary. That's why we we'll have the intersection of that. So this is how we should interpret this set. Okay, this is the set of function or space of functions uh, actually indicated by this. And then we're going to de de uh, define inner product in this space to be, I mentioned this, this is uh, the starting point of our uh, Sobolev space. We're going to take the multi index, it's less than or equal to k, and uh, all the multi index for u, and all the multi index for v, the bar if needed dx. This is where all the u and v are in ck omega. Okay. So that is another example. Now a, a simple fact of this inner product is uh, this is actually the cauchy schwarz inequality. So what it is, just tells us that um, if we consider the norm induced by this inner product, which is just this, now we know that since the inner product, this must be real valued and then the negative. So I can take square root, I will still get a real value. A real value. If I this to be the norm, then uh, the Cauchy Schwarz inequality tells us that this. Is always less than equal to this, right? The proof is the same as uh, the one we did in real analysis. And uh, uh, I want to emphasize one more thing here is that the equality holds if and only if, so basically of this, if equality holds if and only if x and y are linearly dependent. That means either x is zero 
or y is zero, or you can have a way to write x in terms of y. Say for example, x equals to lambda times y. Okay, so either x is zero or y is zero, or both are non-zero, but you can write x as a as a linear function of y. Uh, and if you want to remove this and still get the equality, that means this, that in that case, the lambda has to be greater than zero, greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so either with or without, and you want to be more specific with this. Okay, so let me come to this. If Lambda one or lambda is k. Okay, so that's the Cauchy Schwarz inequality. I will not, I will not, I'll skip the proof, it's uh, just the same as what we did before. And uh, it's used a lot in uh, practice, and I guess all of you will memorize this for uh, the whole time. 